Hi, it's Dwyer. Always 1776.com, a free site. Also, wealthspinning.blogspot.com, a free site. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, let me point out that I believe over time what's real wins out, right? The best ideas ultimately come to the top. It takes some time. There's a group always working against the best ideas. There's another group that's always trying to copy the best ideas and then claim them as their own while trying to push the innovators in the background. We all understand that. But typically, the best ideas do come to the forefront, right? I believe we saw in the 1980s the fall of the Berlin Wall because we all understood that the people in East Germany were being subjugated, didn't have the rights, didn't have the standards of living of the people in West Germany, and that the wall, quite frankly, was not sustainable because, of course, in the East, they understood over time that their system was inferior and they were being deprived. Well, later today, we're going to have a presidential debate between two men who have already served as president of the United States. If there's any debate in which we knew how both contestants were going to govern, it's this one. Don't you know how Donald Trump governs by now? Don't you know exactly what to expect from Joe Biden? Now, here's where we get off what's real. Unfortunately, history has also shown us that you go through periods where the leadership's lacking, where suboptimal strategies are being pursued, where what's real is being pushed aside, as it was in East Germany before the fall of the Berlin Wall, where bad ideas are being pushed aside to, for self-serving agendas of the people who are in power. Now, let's make a basic point here. Both President Trump and President Biden are protectionists. This debate, of course, that they're going to have for the leadership of the United States, right, for this upcoming election, already has been pruned, hasn't it? The non-protectionists aren't going to be in the room. They've set this up where the two parties in possession of practically all of the seats in Congress, the Senate and the House of Representatives, as well as corporate media, isn't this being done by a dying CNN? They've set up this debate where it's only a debate between those already in power on a subset of strategies, none of which might be the optimal strategy. So let me just reveal my bias. I believe in free trade. I don't understand why I can't just go out and buy the best electric vehicle, whether that's American, whether that's Chinese. I don't understand why my government, to which I'm paying taxes here in the United States, is going to actually impose tariffs on me. I have, I have to pay extra to import goods from China, from overseas whether or not those goods are the best goods in the market at the best price. In other words, the people in power are diminishing my choices and my 
standard of living. Right? The real question here is whether that's being done arbitrarily. So, tonight's going to be a big illusion. I get to pick between protectionist A. I get to pick possibly protectionist B as the winner of a debate of ideas. Where, of course, you and I know the winner is protectionism. Right? Bobby Kennedy is not going to be allowed to participate in the debate. Chase Oliver, the Libertarian candidate, who's on most of the ballots in the United States, is not going to be allowed to participate in the debate. Folks, let me make a guarantee to you. The winner of the debate is going to be a protectionist. Right? That's, that's the bottom line. What savvy viewers should be asking themselves is whether protectionism is in the best interest of the United States. Right? You have all these, you know, interesting personalities. Steve Bannon, for example, right? And you hear all these great slogans. They sound good. America first. Right? Are we putting America first when we don't allow Americans to buy the best goods and services wherever they are produced at the best prices? Is America first having us compete with the producers of the best goods and services by ha allowing them to set up a factory here in the United States? that can't compete on price and then setting up some tariff scheme to protect those inefficient producers. Is that America first? Or is America first where I'm able to go out and say, gee, what's the best watch I can buy? I really like the way these Rolexes look. Right? The fact that Rolex isn't made by an American corporation, well, it's my choice to buy a Rolex because I'm spending my money wherever Rolexes are imported from. I, as an American, should have the freedom to buy one. If American companies can't compete in producing that particular item, too bad. It's my money. I get to spend it how I want. Right now, if you're part of the latter group, folks, you're not going to be served by today's debate. Let's talk about some other things. The fact that slogans are replacing actual thought, right? Bernie Sanders has done a great job. Bernie, who, of course, has become a millionaire while being a public servant. Figure that one out, right? It's called writing books. Understand the inverse incentives. If I'm controversial and I write books that placate a book buying subset of the public who view me as a champion for their quirky points of view and they buy my books and I become a millionaire, what incentive do I have to actually think about what's in the best interest of the United States? Right? Am I not getting rich with quirky ideas that appeal to a subset? Don't I have an incentive to come up with clever slogans that sound like winners? That lack gravitas? That lack, worse yet, effectiveness? So, Bernie Sanders has a phrase he throws around, living wage. Great phrase, great slogan. Hard to beat it. Right? The idea is that we need to pay fast food workers, for example, a living wage. Money that's substantial enough where the worker can buy a place to live to support their family. 
be a head of the household. We flock to the idea, right? People who feel that they're a little bit light in the salary area think, hey, government can provide for me here. Who doesn't want a raise? A few extra dollars would help me support my family. Right now, folks, you might even hear a living wage at the debate tonight. Let me tell you what happened in California, where I am. They decided to bump up the living wage. Well, the minimum wage for fast food workers. And by the way, let's not kid ourselves. Gavin Newsom is pushing for a higher minimum wage for health workers. Right? Just to understand what this higher minimum wage has done. I want you to Google the chain Rubio's Fish Tacos. You're going to find out that they've closed many stores. Apparently, the idea of a living wage doesn't apply to the people who have lost their jobs in the fast food industry because of this canard, right? You know, apparently when we think of a living wage, it only applies to a certain subset of workers who get to keep their job. It doesn't apply to the fast food restaurants that have to close because they're already operating on margin. Now, I don't know whether the news has gotten out, but folks, you understand we have a commercial real estate crisis going on right now. If you're a Florida homeowner, particularly if you are subject to HOA fees, let's say you're a condo holder, you're absolutely in shock right now over how those fees have increased. You're wondering, given that, of course, interest rates have gotten higher, right? Certainly higher than the very low rates of a few years ago. Because without higher interest rates, we really have no strategy on fighting inflation. And you understand inflation has, let's be blunt here, lowered your standard of living. You can buy less groceries for your family. Right? No one somehow, when they're talking about a living wage and artificially boosting the wages of fast food workers, no one talks about the inflationary effect. Meanwhile, you, of course, the customer, understand that when your local McDonald's increases wages to $20 an hour, suddenly that Big Mac creeps over $7 a Big Mac in some areas. Suddenly you notice that the burger, 7 the fries, we'll say three. The drink, we'll say two, is coming to $12 for you alone. Then you look at your wife, you look at your two kids, you're doing the math in your head. This fast food meal at McDonald's has now cost you 12 times four, $48. You and I know the next step that inflation is going to cause. You're going to stay home. You're going to say, hey, babe, let's not go to McDonald's. Bit too expensive for us. Let's crack open a few cans of Chef Boyardee for dinner tonight. Right? And of course, you understand that one of the contributing factors to your lower standard of living, you're dealing with more inflation, is your own government increasing what they're calling the living wage. Let me make another point too, because perspective matters. There's another group involved here, never gets mentioned. They're called investors. Right, let's say that I'm an investor, I've invested in the local McDonald's. Right, folks, I'm not guaranteed anything. You understand the restaurant can actually lose money. I could be saddled with losses. 
right? I hear about a living wage. Why doesn't the living wage conversation actually apply to me? How come when they're talking about a living wage, the living wage is just on the workers working at the McDonald's who don't get laid off because of the higher cost structure caused by arbitrary government meddling in the fast food industry, right? Don't the people in the fast food industry know market prices already? If you've been a customer at a McDonald's and you suddenly see a Big Mac price over seven, aren't you aware of the fact that that's more than you budgeted for the meal, that that's more than you paid for the Big Mac last year? Right, folks, investors don't get guarantees. The living wage sloganeering policy of government doesn't extend to provide relief for investors. What happens is suddenly the McDonald's is forced to raise prices on things like Big Macs. They're forced to tell some workers, hey player, you lost your job. Don't blame us. Blame the government that has mandated that we pay $20 an hour here. We just don't have the customers. And of course, the McDonald's is losing customers to the competition. I'm not talking about other fast food restaurants. I'm talking about Chef Boyardee on a supermarket shelf, right? Families out there know they've had to cut back. Let me also point out too, Hooters. I know many people are offended by Hooters, right? You know, the idea is, oh gee, you know, Hooters is this waitress outfit, really the kind of outfit I want my daughter to wear when she's working, right? Aren't older men going into Hooters just to glare at the women, right? Let me point out, just a truth here, Hooters has had to close something like 40 stores nationally, right? Are you better off with the people at Hooters losing their jobs with the businesses at a time where America is vulnerable right now to a recession? Right? Understand the Fed's using code language when they say, oh, interest rates will drop. Right? The idea is that commerce is dropping at such, a, such an extent that interest rates will drop with commerce. Right? This is the kind of stuff they push on voters during election years. So you're supposed to be so confused when you cast your ballot that you think, oh, forget what I've seen. Inflation's actually dropping because interest rates are dropping. Well, just to understand what's also dropping. Hooters jobs. Right? Everyone loves to criticize a bar, an establishment, until, of course, they go out of business and people are unemployed. They're sitting on their hands. The local standards of living have fallen. The local economy has fallen. Right, folks? Look at the fallout right now in the fast food industry. Understand how big it is. You have Burger King, you have McDonald's, big names in the space. Big names in the space. And they're now talking about trying to find ways to give you $5 meals. They've been hit to such an extent that they're now turning around, trying to reassure customers, hey, we're going to have low price options for you. Think about how ridiculous it is. What was our government in the first place doing trying to mandate higher wages in the space? Understand what's real. Markets are beautiful things. Right? Understand, markets sort through the prices. You're at a McDonald's in part because of the pricing, the cost structure. Right? What's government doing getting between you and your restaurant? It's simply ridiculous. So, let's just say another truth, too. You know, Peter Schiff, years ago, had a phrase. It was, there's always a bull market out there somewhere. Then Jim Cramer copied it. Right? This is how you make it in television. 
right? The phrase had some truth to it. Jim Cramer started saying, hey, there's always a bull market out there someplace. Let's talk about the corollary. There's always a bear market out there someplace. Right, folks, there are many housing markets across the country. Right, Austin, for example, Austin, Texas, that are post-peak, we'll call it. Right, people are also waking up to the opportunity costs of holding a house. Right, you're there in your house and you're paying property taxes and stuff like that. You notice that the renters in your own neighborhood are getting a better deal than you. Right, they're able to live within a block of you and they're paying less than you are for the house. Well, now we have the coup de grace, don't we? Look on a chart of Bitcoin. Look on a chart of gold and silver. You don't even have to get experimental with digital currency. Right? You're going to notice that those are up this year. In some cases, up big. Understand, too, the story for gold. If, in fact, fiat currencies start crashing all over the world, if, in fact, the United States, this is a distinct possibility, reaches the conclusion that they need to reprice gold in American dollars, right, to make up for at least a portion of the American debt. Understand this happened in the 1930s with FDR. We're not talking theory here, we're talking history. Right, you understand under such a scenario, gold could more than 2x overnight. Now, you're a homeowner paying a heavy mortgage, right? You realize that the market's so fragile that they're in reintroducing adjustable rate mortgages into the market. And, of course, the concept of an opportunity cost looms. You're leaving money on the table by not being part of the gold market right now, aren't you? You're leaving money on the table, not being part of the Bitcoin market, aren't you? Especially now that you have a spot Bitcoin ETF, right? We're soon going to have spot Ethereum ETFs. Even proof of stake coins are now getting spot ETFs. You understand that this might be, and there are no certainties in markets, right? The only certainties I know of are death and taxes. There might be a structural move away from fiat currency toward precious metals and digital gold, right? Not all digital currencies, just some. And you understand the holders of gold, silver, Bitcoin might reap a bonanza by tying up your money in housing at these multiples to median income. Aren't you paying too much of an opportunity cost to do so? Right? If you were to sell your home and buy a commensurate amount of gold, in four years, which one would be worth more? If the answer is gold, aren't you missing that market by having your money tied up in real estate at a time when young people probably won't have to pay the multiple relative to median income to buy such homes four years from now, right? I think people are waking up to the idea that in areas like California where you have a 10 to 1 to 12 to 1 ratio of home prices to median income, that that market is unsustainable. So, let's get back to tonight, right? They're going to talk about the economy, and I'm sure someone is going to say the economy is great, right? Try to prevent yourself from laughing. Folks, you still have an inverted yield curve. Let me just throw out some numbers here. The one month, the interest rate's 5.3%. The 10-year, it's a full percentage point lower at 4.3 percent 
The 30-year, it's 4.4%. Folks, we have an inverted yield curve. Students of economics know that this is one of the best predictors of recessions. It should be the reverse, right? If you're making a longer-term commitment with your capital, the longer-term rate should be higher. Not the one month. What's the one month doing above the 10-year? What I want people to do, too, whatever these politicians say tonight, is to look at the Buffett indicator. Right now, maybe, just maybe, there are a few people out there who know markets better than Warren Buffett. I say few, really it's very few. Right, folks, the Buffett indicator right now is around 200%. Right, anything above 100 connotes a level of overvaluation that should concern all of us. The fundamentals aren't there for current stock market prices. Right, the price has a connection to future profits. Right, folks, the future profits aren't there. Now, everyone thinks, everyone, that they're holding the exception, right? Everyone thinks, hey, I have NVIDIA. What could possibly go wrong even at these valuations? Haven't the people on CNBC and CNN told me that AI is the future. Who is better positioned than NVIDIA for this AI future? Let me just tell you, let's be students of history. Understand even the best ideas, Amazon, years ago, have price volatility. Right? Look at how Amazon dropped in price early on. Look at how Amazon stock languished until the market was ready for it. Right? Stocks don't go straight up. Now you're telling me at NVIDIA's $3 trillion market cap that everyone is acting coherently? Folks, that, that's just not what's happening. Right, NVIDIA issues a stock split which does not increase revenue for the company and suddenly the stock price goes up. Right, just understand, animal spirits are a great thing until they're in excess. The minute you de-link from profits, revenue, earnings, you're losing a lot. Right, so... Try not to laugh tonight when Joe Biden, in an inflationary economy, tries to convince you that the economy is going gangbusters with a $34 trillion debt. As for President Trump, you know, let's just say, I believe in time we're going to realize that the COVID crisis was completely mismanaged, right folks? They prevented people from working on the flimsiest science possible. Now you have people like Dr. Fossey, who elected him, openly admitting that there really was no real scientific basis to social distancing. Wasn't that a big part of our lives a few years ago? My daughter was playing softball, and it was ridiculous. First off, the kids had to wear masks, right? If you looked up the data, you realize that kids were almost immune from COVID. Let me point out that in every disease, there are going to be outliers. I have no doubt there are parents out there who lost their children to COVID, right? And I'm sure you can talk about individual cases where people say, wow, that's terrible. That family lost a child to COVID. But just understand the numbers show that those victims were outliers. That kids had a built-in immunity to COVID. Kids were able, relatively speaking, to handle COVID much better 
than adults, than older people. Rather than have a targeted response, what we did is we had the young kids on my daughter's softball team all wearing these ridiculous masks, right? We ourselves, the parents, were wearing these ridiculous masks and we were standing six feet away from each other without any real scientific justification for that. You know what our government did? They not only prevented us from working. Think about all the businesses you were a customer of that you couldn't go to. But then our government encouraged monopolies. Right? They said, hey, Costco, you can stay open. Publicly traded company. Right? The people who knew what they were doing realized this was a bonanza for Costco. They went out and they bought Costco stock. They gained the system. Our government set up ways to gain the system on the flimsiest science possible. Right, folks? Under President Trump's watch, our government poured trillions of dollars into the economy and went trillions of dollars into debt. Those are your choices tonight. Joe Biden, right, who, of course, came up with the great idea of reassigning college debt away from the borrowers toward people who did not go to college. Right, folks? That's another great slogan, loan forgiveness. Why isn't the actual slogan loan reassignment? Hey, the professors have been paid. The university received the money. There is a debt out there. The debt doesn't go away. Right? People can call it loan forgiveness. Just understand, we still have to pay the debt. The we is no longer the borrower who borrowed the money and who got whatever benefits came from the college experience, right? A degree with higher earning power. No, the debt went to the rest of us. And somehow an administration behind that thinks that's something to crow about, right? So you have debt reassignment on one side of the aisle. At the other podium is the president behind the biggest health boondoggle and mismanagement, right, really of the 20th century, excuse me, the 21st century, right, that we're still climbing out of. Those are your choices tonight, right? Do we really believe that clever one-liners and responses that are crowd-tested and calibrated are actually going to optimize the chances of this country picking the best leader possible at the upcoming election when, of course, the corporate media event tonight doesn't even include all of the candidates who are on at least 45 state ballots. Right? It's ridiculous. With regard to markets, too, let's talk about the arbitrary nature of government. Crypto was too much like kryptonite to our Congress, who didn't really know what crypto was for years. We kept hearing crypto was too risky and all this other stuff, right? Think about the lack of leadership there. It's institutional investors. It's Wall Street. It's Fidelity. It's BlackRock who then get involved in crypto and then start, you know, it's the people, right? Crypto users who get involved in crypto, then start participating in markets, then realize that, quite frankly, the technology is groundbreaking, right? The ability to do digital transactions without a double spend is one of the great moments technologically over the last hundred years, at least. Now suddenly, our Congress, who, if you believe them just, what, three years ago, 
was warning you crypto's too risky and all this other stuff while of course they're dealing with several insolvent programs right good luck getting your promised social security benefits right understand a lot of these state pension programs are underwater are you listening Kentucky are you listening Illinois right now suddenly the group behind that has fallen in love with crypto where they not only have authorized a spot Bitcoin ETF which is proof of work in other words has miners uh, not validators now they're in the world of proof of stake spot ETFs with Ethereum now I'm a big fan of crypto right but just to understand I'd be in big trouble if I were listening to these yahoos about anything certainly the crypto market understand Congress is responding to the market they're not leading the market both of these guys were presidents for years right Trump a full term Biden of course is in his fourth year as president of the United States tonight I'm expecting to hear them talk about crypto didn't they have enough time here to get it right given that the US dollar in my opinion at least is more fragile than Bitcoin right Bitcoin at least is limited supply right both the dollar and Bitcoin are on computers right understand how dollars are created right it's fractional reserve banking what increases the money supply is when banks start lending out money that they don't have right and it's legal just to understand in that world of fragility the government has finally come to the conclusion that Bitcoin is worthy of SEC approval in the form of spot ETFs for the most known Bitcoin uh, the most known cryptos the number of spot ETFs will grow right we're in a equal protection environment here in the United States right but understand the guys debating tonight are late to the party not early they're late to the party Congress the regulators are late to the party I got news for you that's the way it usually is right so really what we should be asking ourselves is are we hearing a diversity of approaches to solving our financial crisis folks when you owe 34 trillion dollars and you're not in a world war right Pearl Harbor hasn't been bombed in the last few decades right when you're in the hole almost 35 trillion dollars when the yield curve is inverted and has been for some time when the Buffett indicator is at an extremely elevated level right now that screams of a coming price drop in equities of at least 25% right you have to take what's said by the president who spent trillions on the COVID crisis and by the president who has reassigned debt away from borrowers to the rest of the public you have to take what they say with a skeptical eye right we need a Malay in the United States right not a 81 year old and a 77 year old who really haven't shown an ability to take advantage of world trade those are my views let me hear yours let me point out too that with regard to AI and I use AI right with regard to AI just understand that even the best ideas 
can take time to develop. Also understand too that some ideas that we thought were the best ideas. Please look at the EV market right now. EV sales are down 30% in Germany right now. I mean, understand the EV drop in sales is a worldwide phenomenon. And we all thought that EVs were going to take over the driving world. Certainly we thought that here in California because Gavin Newsom, our beloved governor, who of course uh, had to survive a recall election, uh, put in place rules that will eventually outlaw the internal combustion engine here in the United States when EVs were hot, right? It's amazing how fast these politicians are to, you know, try to diminish long-standing technologies in favor of new technologies that the public doesn't know enough about, right? Hopefully everyone watching this video understands that to create the electricity used in EVs requires fossil fuels, things like natural gas, right? In other words, it's just a matter of, do you see the pollution leaving your tailpipe in an internal combustion engine car? Or is the pollution already baked in, away from your vision, by the use of fossil fuels to create the electricity that the car is running on? Right? Zero emission slogans shouldn't mask the fact that EVs use fossil fuels. Right? Well, let's just say certain markets that we thought were certainties, we're now finding are uncertainties. Let me make another point, too. You remember the phrase, the Magnificent Seven, right? Obviously, that's dropping now. <laughs> but you remember the Magnificent Seven. You understand that Nothing is leading to the concentration of capital more than uh, EVs, right? Apple has been talking with Meta, two of the Magnificent Seven, about combining forces in the EV market, right? You understand that companies like Anthropic, among their owners, have Amazon and Microsoft. Right? You get that. It's the biggest companies in the world, Google with its Gemini, that have, you know, beachheads in the, e, in the AI market right now. Right now, no one is going to talk about that. I don't have a problem with it. My idea is simply, look, if the technology is valuable, then well-capitalized outfits uh, that have the free cash flow are going to be able to invest in that technology ahead of everyone else. But just understand, when you're hearing about fighting inequality and there's a silence on the concentration of capital in AI coming from the, some of the richest corporations in the world, <laughs> right? Then you should be skeptical. Be skeptical tonight as you watch the presidential debate. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours. I hope you leave them in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.